We have two very special guests today. Justin and Trisha Davis are here. They are pastors, they are authors, they are podcasters, they are church planners. They've got an incredible story. I got to hear the story for the first time in 2009. Justin and I have been friends for a number of years. He's been a huge encouragement to me and it's just a thrill for us to have them here today. So would you help me welcome my friends, Justin and Trisha Davis. Thanks so much for having us today. If you skied here, congratulations on getting here on time. Yeah, Matt and I just had a really awkward, um, oh, my mic wasn't on. You, you, she said, is your mic on? And I said, yes, it's marriage right there. Uh, is your mic on? Yes, it's on. Then it wasn't on. So <laughs> grateful to be here. Uh, we absolutely love Matt and Kelly, and we live in Indianapolis where they're from. And so it's just been a phenomenal weekend. If you weren't at the marriage event on Friday, uh, we did miss you. Um, but we got to have dinner with Matt and Kelly last night. Just hear about all that LifeBridge is doing, all that God is doing through LifeBridge and just some exciting stuff. And uh, just grateful for the opportunity to be uh, here with you as part of this, um, you know, uh, Mary series that we're in. Now, maybe you're thinking today, there's not a lot of similarities between Indianapolis, Indiana and Denver area, Colorado, but we do have something that connects us heart to heart. Peyton Manning, all right? So, you know, it, it, you know, he's a Denver Bronco. He's an Indianapolis Colt. We're basically brothers and sisters right now. Okay? We're, just, <laughs> we're sharing life. And so that's one thing that connects us heart to heart. So we're grateful to be here. Well, beyond just our names, we want to share a little bit about us and our family. Justin and I have been married for 28 years. Oh, that's where I hope all of you are like, oh, no, she's too young. But okay, whatever. Uh, we have five kids ranging from 27. No, oh, she's too young. Okay, 27 to 13. We have three biological sons. And then we adopted our son and daughter who are the oldest of five siblings uh, from Indianapolis. We adopted them uh, six years ago at when they were seven and nine. And so we've had boys for a long time and now I've become a girl mom. And so it is just a, a wild season for us, but we absolutely love um, our kids and getting to just walk alongside them in literally feels like every season of life. <laughs> and so Trish and I are here this weekend to continue this series that you guys started last week called For Better or For Worse. And so if you are a guest speaker today, or a guest speaker, if you are a guest here today, you came on Guest Speaker Sunday and we're talking about marriage. Um, but just come back next week. Matt will be back up next week. Um, but if you are here today, I just want you to know that we're grateful that you're here. If you're watching online, so grateful that you're here as well, um, because we feel like God has a divine appointment for you today. No matter what your marital status is, no matter what your relationship with God even looks like today. Trish and I are going to share a little bit of our story with you this morning. And as we share our story, our prayer is that you find yourself in the story. Now you realize that regardless of your relationship status and regardless of uh, if you feel close to God or far away from God today, that God is pursuing you and that he longs to have a relationship with you. And more than the content that we're going to share with you, our hope is that you leave here feeling like you had coffee with a good friend and that you feel like God directly spoke to you on how you can take one step toward him and if you're married, one step toward your spouse. So what I know to be true about everybody here in person and online is that regardless if you're eight or you're 80, we all have a vision for our life. Uh, maybe for you, middle school is a hot mess and you're like, I have a vision for how high school is going to go down. Uh, maybe for you, you have a vision for like my epicness is going to take place in my career. Like you just have this belief that if you love God and you just follow after him, you're going to live this up into the right life. And, and that was just and I, we were no different. We met and fell in love at Bible college in way back in 1993. And we fell in love with each other and fell in love um, with just doing ministry in the local church. And so we got engaged and we began planning like our epic vision for this up and right life. And for us, it was going to begin on our honeymoon. And so we began planning and I grew up um, in a city, uh, you guys are known for your beautiful mountains. I grew up in Joliet, Illinois, um, south of Chicago, and we're known for our prison. Um, we're pretty <laughs> proud of it. Um, if you uh, have seen the Blues Brothers, that's our prison. That is our claim to fame. Uh, but I grew up in a really diverse inner city setting. Justin grew up just south or just west of Indianapolis, Indiana in a smaller rural town. And so we grew up completely different. So when we were planning our vision for life, 
It began with this wedding day. The wedding day was fine, but our honeymoon, like, it needed to be epic. Well, one thing that we had in common, even though we grew up completely different, is that we both grew up lower income. And so I only went on like one major vacation that I can remember, and it was this magical place, not Disneyland, it was this magical place called Wisconsin Dells. And if you've not been there, it's not the mountains, but it was magical at the time. And so that was the major vacation my family went on. The one vacation Justin's family went on was to Holden Beach, North Carolina. And so in our young minds, we thought we could only go to a place for our honeymoon that we had been before. I'm not really sure why. And so thankfully the beach went out. The problem is, is we got married in Joliet that's near Chicago. And you all are smart enough to know that they are not close. So we thought we'll get through the wedding day, which we did, and we'll drive just a couple of hours our first night married because, you know, driving 15 hours is probably not wise. And so ladies, back to that vision, right? We're going to get married. We have this vision that our man, he's going to scoop us up. He's going to carry us over the threshold. It's going to be so amazing. But I was so tired that when we got to the hotel, I was like, dude, you need to get to step in. Because I got to get out of this dress to go to sleep. Like, I don't know if you remember the day. It's been long, and lots of sleep people. Sleep was the operative word there. I was like, oh, oh, time out, my friend. Like, I didn't get married for sleep, right? I got married for some action. So let's light a candle. Let's throw some boys to men. Let's get this party started. And all the students are like, what's happening right now in church? <laughs> okay, so... As he tried to get the party started, I wasn't just crying, I was sobbing, which is never good your first night married. So Justin came to the bathroom door and he could hear my sobs and he knocks on the door and he's like, hey, are you okay? And the only thing I could get out of my mouth was, I need you to go to Walmart. Like right now I need you to go. Like why would I go to Walmart at four o'clock in the morning on my wedding night in my tuxedo? Well, apparently as we arrived at the hotel, something else arrived for Trish. And so I walked down two aisles that day. The first aisle would say I do, and then the feminine product aisle would say I'm not so sure. I have a sister, I've never bought those for her, so I just got one of everything. And you know you're in a bad place in your life when the person that's working the 4 a.m. shift at Walmart is feeling sorry for you, right? And she's looking at me like I'm coming from prom. I'm like, just check me out. My wife is eagerly anticipating my ride at the hotel. Yeah, I was totally asleep when he got back. No action, nada, yeah. zip. We've been in therapy ever since. So we wake up <laughs> the next morning, we make the long trip to the beach. We are young and in love. And this is the second time that both Justin and I have ever seen the ocean. So we drop our bags and we play in the glorious blue ocean water for hours. And a couple hours in, I was like, ooh, my, my skin kind of hurts. And then I remembered that I didn't put sunscreen on. So our first day of our honeymoon, I was like, hey, I'm really sorry, but I need you to not touch me. In fact, I need you to not talk to me because even your breath hurts my face. It's a- <laughs> For the next three days, nothing touched her body but aloe vera. And you know it's an epically bad honeymoon when you're calling your dad collect? Because that's what you do in 1995. And you're talking to your, some of you need to Google what a collect call is. And you're talking to your dad about the action you're not having on your honeymoon. It's a very awkward conversation. I'm like, Dad, it's been four days of nothing. I'm like, is that normal? He's like, well, in a few years, we'll be, but not right now. He's like, you know what? We're not even Catholic, but I think you could have known that. Just high five, walk away. So, yes, great <laughs> advice. Okay, so I know you're feeling really bad for Justin. The very last day of our honeymoon, we had all of this money because we didn't go anywhere. Well, we did actually see the movie Clueless was kind of a precursor. <laughs> yeah. We saw the movie Clueless on our honeymoon, which really just was... A description of our life at that Yeah, point. you know, up into the right life, <laughs> clueless. And so we rented a jet ski on our very last day of our honeymoon. And this was the point that I realized who the rule follower is in this relationship and who the rule breaker is. And so we get on this jet ski. And to all my rule following friends, don't you think it was fair to go over the rules of engagement before we drive this thing? But then the moment happened. Have you ever had a moment where time like slows down just enough for you to think, I'm about to die. This is this moment. <laughs> there is this huge party yacht. I'd never seen such a thing in real life with people on it and music playing. And I was looking at the people, but my young groom who hadn't looked at the rule book to how to drive this thing is looking at the ginormous waves that this boat is making. And before I realize what is happening, he full throttles it to the boat to the point that the people on the boat are like, what's going on? We hit a wave so hard and so fast. I literally shoot straight up in the air to the point that I'm like, what's up to the people on the party? Yeah. <laughs> and then I came down in a belly flop position and 
that's what the people on the boat said. And all, <laughs> like, all of my skin just came off. It was so romantic. And I was like, payback. I mean, I didn't say it out loud. I was just silently thinking it to myself. But if we were sitting at a cup of coffee together, I'm going to assume that you have a vision for your life. And for many of us, we have this belief that if we just love God and love the people that God has placed in our life, that surely we're just going to live an up and to the right life. So we got married the summer before my second senior year of college. I squeezed four years into five. I just wanted more student loans. And so we get married. We're young. We're in love. We're broke. And then we realized four months into marriage that Trish doesn't have the flu like we thought she did, that she actually is pregnant with our oldest son, Micah. And so life is coming at us very fast. And so I graduate and we dove headfirst into student ministry for the next seven years, just helping students come into a relationship with Christ. And then seven years into marriage, we felt like God had laid on our hearts uh, this vision to plant a church for people who didn't go to church. And we never planted a church before, and, but we felt like this was a, a mission that God had put on us. And so we sold everything that we owned. We had $5,000 to our name, which means we didn't own a lot of stuff. And we moved to the northeast side of Indianapolis, about 45 minutes from where we live now. And our vision was, by the time we're out of this money, we should have a church going. Which sounds very faith-filled. It's a very unwise way to start a church, but that was how we did it. And so we moved on June 1st, 2002. And on June 9th, we had our very first service. And 12 people showed up. Now, as a church planner, you're looking for any sign at all that God may be remotely in this. I'm thinking 12 people, 12 disciples. This is biblical, right? Three of these people have on sandals. Jesus himself wore sandals. It's anointed. It's going to work. Well, three pe- or 12 people became 15 people, and 15 people became 25. And then we had a couple of large churches in our area that got behind us, and they gave us meeting space and office space and resources. And they told their people to leave and go with us and help us start this new church. We launched public services in September of 2003 with over 250 people in attendance. And from September of 2003 to Easter of 2005, the the church would grow to about 700 people. But more than the numbers, people were coming to Christ and people who hadn't been in church in years were coming back to church and they were being baptized and they were finding a home and community and they were using their gifts. It was like they had a front row seat to the book of Acts. But even as things were going well with the church and it was growing and exploding in growth, there were deficiencies in my faith and there were definitely deficiencies in our marriage relationship that began to be very, very obvious. And what we realize now three years into this church plant and 10 years into marriage is that Trish and I had become really good ministry partners and really toxic marriage partners. You know, we can sense when things are off, Justin and I call it like we're just not on the same page. And this goes beyond just marriage. Like we just feel it in life. Like it's just, it's, things are just not going well. So I just need to look for the next thing. And here, when Justin and I planted our first church, back in 2002, statistically, 80% of church plants failed. And so the fact that our church was thriving and we have three young boys, like we were the poster children of, you know, pastoring and church planning, but we knew that our marriage was off. And so we just kind of looked to the next thing to achieve. So it was our 10 year anniversary and we thought, you know, we're just tired. We've ran really hard the past couple of years and we, we just need to get, we need to go away, like without the kids. And so we went on this little cruise, four day cruise, and we just fell in love with each other. We had so much fun. We didn't have responsibilities as parents. We didn't have responsibilities as like ministry. It was just the two of us. And in our minds, we thought, well, we're healed. Like we had achieved reconnection. The problem is, is that when we stepped off the boat, we stepped right into the same dysfunctional patterns, the same conversations, the the same argument over and over again, and truly expected because we went on a boat for four days that things would be different. What I didn't realize is that my heart and the heart of our marriage could go from this place of being so tender and feeling so connected to truly drifting so far from one another and really so far from the heart of God. You know what the cruise allowed us to do is it allowed us to change our behavior for a few days, but neither one of us really had to change our heart. It's like our marriage had a brain tumor and we were taking some Advil to help the pain go away. And so we come back and we go right back into the same dysfunctional communication patterns and conflict resolution patterns and and workaholism and, and scheduling and kids. And there became this alarming gap between the marriage that we had and the marriage that we thought we would have. You ever experienced a gap like that in your life? 
Maybe for some of you today, there's a gap between the job that you have and the career that you thought you would have. Maybe for some of you, there's a gap between the mom that you are and the mom that you thought you would be because mom guilt is real. Maybe for some of us today, there's a gap between the husband that we are and the husband we promised we would be. How do you close that gap? How do you reconcile that gap? Maybe if we're really honest today, there's a gap between the relationship with God we have and the relationship with God we pretend we have. How do you close that gap? Trish and I had this vision that longer married equals a better marriage, right? The longer we're married, the better our marriage is going to be. Now here we are 10 years into marriage and longer married didn't equal a better marriage. Longer married meant louder arguments. Longer married meant less patience. Longer married meant more irritable. Longer married meant the same argument over and over and over again. We never thought about anything new. All this culminated on October 9th, 2005. I came home from church and Trish was laying down for an afternoon nap and I said, hey, we need to have a conversation. She said, okay, about what? I said, about us. What about us? I said, I'm done. You're done with what? I said, I'm done with you. Like, I'm out. I don't want to be married anymore. I don't want to be in ministry anymore. I'm not in love with you anymore. I'm having an affair. It's with your best friend. I want to be with her. And I wish 18 years later, I wish it was a confession of remorse. And I wish it was a confession of repentance. It was just a confession of resignation. I don't know if you've given to a relationship and you give and you give and you give and what you think you deserve in return isn't reciprocated. What begins to happen is a sense of entitlement begins to live in your heart and that person can never repay you all that you think they owe. And that's exactly where I was in my relationship with Trish. She wasn't going to be the wife I felt like I deserved and so I was out. Well, obviously the intensity of our conversation just escalated and Trish left the house hysterically and a few minutes later the chairman of our elders called and he was just screaming at me on the phone. This has to be some kind of joke. Please tell me this is a sick joke. We had seven elders at the time. Three of them had been with us since day one. And our three-year-old church, average age of 28, we'd just gone through a capital campaign and we raised a million dollars to buy the building that we were meeting in. And our chairman of our elders had given $250,000 of that. And I had cheated on all of them too. And they came over to my house, not trying to talk me out of the consequences of my choices because I wasn't going to be the pastor of the church anymore, but the choice itself to leave my wife and my three boys who were nine, six, and three at the time. And I just couldn't hear it. Trish didn't want me at the house anymore, so I went and checked into a hotel. And as I arrived at the hotel, a lady from our church called and she said, if you have any hope at all of restoring your marriage, you're going to go to this counseling session that we've created for you tomorrow at 10 a.m. And I just thought, counseling, shh, I don't go to counseling, I'm a pastor. By God's grace, I show up reluctantly to this counseling session and I sat down in this woman's office and told her about as much of the story as I've just told you. And she kind of interrupts me and she says, can I just ask you something? Why are you here? Like, what do you hope to accomplish with this counseling session? I said, if I'm just being straight up honest with you, here's what I want you to help me figure out. I want you to help me figure out how God's going to bless my life no matter who I choose. That's what I want. And she said something in that moment that became the linchpin for the restoration that God would do in our marriage. She said, I can help broken people. I can't help hard-hearted people. And I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old. I've been a pastor for 10 years. I'd never really experienced brokenness in my life. Trish didn't want me at the house. She packed up everything that I owned, kicked me out of the house. I moved in with a family that had helped us start the church. Uh, We didn't talk for the next 10 days. We were separated for two and a half months. And we had a mediator that helped us get our kids back and forth from one house to another for the first 10 days of our separation. And God began to break my heart for my marriage again, not knowing if I was going to get a second chance. And so I started going to counseling by myself. 10 days into our separation, Tricia called me on my cell phone and I tell people all the time, if the prodigal son's dad would have had a cell phone, this would have been a call he would have made. And she said, I hear you've been going to counseling. I said, yes. She said, well, I'm willing to go with you. So a few days later, we started going to counseling together, and we went to counseling four days a week for the next two months. So we tell couples all the time, if you feel like your marriage is struggling, our counselor will see us four days a week. That's how jacked up we were, okay? Hang in there. You're going to be okay. (laughs) But God began to use the frequency and the intensity of those counseling sessions to peel back layers of brokenness and hurt and dysfunction and half-truths and bitterness and resentment that we hadn't taken the time or had the courage to talk about in the first 10 years of our marriage and began a restoration process in our relationship that continues to this day. You know, with Justin's confession, I didn't just lose my marriage. 
I lost, you know, my best friend of seven years. And as I've gotten older, and I think those of you who are kind of in my same season of life, you look back on those relationships and it's just a cherished time where you raise your kids together and share pregnancies together. And I had lost that too. With Justin's confession that Sunday, uh, me and my boys, we never went back. And I just remember just sitting on the couch and Justin and I being separated and my boys were sitting at my feet and I'm not really sure why. Um, and they were like nine, seven, and, and three. And I had just hit my breaking point. I don't know if you've ever been in a place with God where you just like, man, I, I was faithful. Like I followed you. I, I, I was, you know, like you called me, I was there. So like, what, what is this? where the vision that you had for your life has not come into fruition, it's actually become your worst nightmare. And I remember my, my Bible was on my side table and I just, I just told God, I'm like, I'm done, I'm out. Like if you are who you say you are, then you need to show up like now. And this is your chance. I'm gonna open my Bible and like, if you don't speak, I'm out. And in God's kindness, uh, I ended up opening my Bible to Hebrews and it was like he, he saw me because he knows I love the book of Hebrews. It's this amazing book that takes Old Testament principles and it brings it into light of the, the new gospel found in Jesus Christ. And so I thought, man, God, you are going to encourage me. And then I started reading this passage in Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 10. And it says this, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best that they knew how. But God's discipline is always right and good for us. Now, when I began to read that text, I about lost my mind. My God, what? I don't need any more discipline. Like, I, I don't know how much more you want from me. Like, have you ever been there where you just feel like I have nothing else to give? And I just felt him gently whisper to me, keep reading. And so I did. It says, but God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means we will share in his holiness. Then verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. God was saying, I see your pain. I see your struggle. I know that this is hard, but would you lean in? The second half of verse 11 says this, but afterwards... There will be a quiet harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and stand firm on your shaky legs. Mark a straight path for your feet. Then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble, but will become strong. There's so much of our story that I wish that we could share with you today, but what we wanna close with is just two principles that we talk about in our book that we have leaned in, that they shaped us then and they shape us now, what it means to lean into the discipline of God and to experience his holiness and to experience what it means to be so shaky on your legs that you can still stand firm in Christ. Trish and I uh, were out of ministry for four years, uh, never thinking we'd ever go back into ministry. And as Matt mentioned in his intro of us, we shared our testimony for the first time in 2009 at the church that Matt was on staff at and it just began to open up doors uh, for us to be able to share with people. Uh, Craig Rochelle says, people are impressed with your strengths, but they connect with you through your weaknesses. And so that's kind of what our mission has been over the last 12 years is we really try to help people connect to God through uh, his power through our weaknesses. And so in 2013, we wrote a book called Beyond Ordinary, When a Good Marriage Just Isn't Good Enough. And it's 12 principles of how you can live an extraordinary marriage. And then three weeks ago, uh, my second book came out. It's called Being Real is Greater Than Being Perfect, How Transparency Leads to Transformation. And one of the things we began to realize as we began to talk and uh, share with churches is that all of us want to change. We all want something extraordinary in our life. We want to see transformation take place. We don't know how to get there. And so we feel like our faith is defective. And so I want to share a principle with you, and then Trisha will close with a principle. And the first principle I want to share with you is that ordinary is defeated in your life when you tell the truth. Ordinary is defeated in your life when you tell the truth. I mentioned that we started going to counseling, so we started going to counseling four days a week for the next month. So after 30 days, we'd gone to 16 counseling sessions. That is a lot of counseling. That's like a year's worth of counseling in 30 days. And guys, we were crushing it. I'm, just gonna, I'm not bragging, but we were doing so good. 
and trust was starting to be rebuilt. And we were starting to move closer to one another. We had circled the day on the calendar. I was going to move back home. Our counselor was so proud of us. And he's like, Justin, you guys are coming up on a really important turning point in your relationship because Trisha's starting to believe you again. She's starting to trust you again. So if you've left anything out, now's the time to share it because unconfessed sin will always lead to repeated behavior. So if you don't want to be back here in three months or 13 months or 13 years, you better come clean right now. And I knew in my heart I was leaving things out. Not because I wanted to hurt Trish, but because I thought if she knew that, it would be over. But I felt like the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and said, this isn't about your marriage anymore. Are you ever going to be a person of integrity? Are you ever going to have a right relationship with God? And so I took a deep breath and I said to Trish and the counselors, I said, the counselor, I said, as far as the affair goes, I've told you everything, but I have more to share with you. I said, I was sexually abused when I was a kid and I've never gotten help for it. I've never told anyone about it. And I'm not trying to excuse my choices. I'm just trying to tell you there's a broken part of me that I cannot fix. So I've struggled with pornography for the last 10 years and I've deflected it and I've denied it and I've preached against it and I've counseled people through it and I've lied to you about it. And if you want to divorce me, you can have everything. This is not about us anymore. This is about me finally being a person of truth. And in the act of grace and mercy, unlike anything I'd ever experienced, she said, now we can start over. Now we can begin again because I finally know the real you. And you guys, I wish that was the finish line. We high-fived and left and were happily ever after. That was really the starting line of what became a two-year journey of rebuilding trust and finding healing from sexual abuse and finding freedom from sexual addiction. And one of the things I've learned over the last 12 years as we've talked to couples and shared our story is that we were created for intimacy. And the word intimacy literally means to be fully known. And if you're married or you're going to be married someday, God has created you to be fully known by your spouse. And if you're a follower of Jesus, God has created you to experience intimacy, to be fully known by him, to be fully known so that you could be fully loved. The problem is we, we desire intimacy. Our greatest desire is that we would be known and our greatest fear is that we won't be loved. And so we don't compromise truth in our relationships because we want to be liars. We compromise truth in relationships because we want to be loved. We think to ourselves, if that person ever knew that about me, they wouldn't love me. And so we hold back in our relationship with God because we convince ourselves, if God ever knew that about me, he wouldn't love me. And so we compartmentalize our life. And we hold back different areas of our life from God. Can I just tell you something today? God knows you fully and he loves you anyway. Mm -hmm. That's grace. And so we have a pain quotient that we put on our relationships and we think that's as much pain as this relationship can take. So this is as much truth as I'm going to offer. The problem is because you and I were created for intimacy, we were created to be fully known. Every time we compromise truth in a relationship, we put a lid or a cap on the amount of intimacy that relationship is capable of experiencing. See, you can only be loved to the extent that you're known. And so, you know, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said the truth will set you free. What he conveniently left out is it will make you miserable first. But what I've found in my life is that short-term misery for long-term freedom is a trade worth making. So maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you feel this distance in your relationship with God. Like you, you come to church and you sing the songs and you raise your hands and you go through the motions and you serve in the kids' ministry because that's extra credit in heaven. Right? You're doing all of the religious things, but you can't close that gap. You still feel that distance. My question to you would be, are you offering all of your heart to God? Is there a part of your life you're holding back? You can have this part of me, God, but not this part. See, God only transforms the parts of our heart that we're willing to give to him. Just like he doesn't force himself into our salvation, he won't force himself into our transformation. The pathway to transformation is honesty. It's giving all of our heart to God. Maybe you're here today and you feel distance in your marriage relationship. And you think to yourself, man, if my spouse ever knew that, they wouldn't love me. See, you're created for intimacy and vulnerability is risky. Vulnerability, it, it, it puts you in a position that you could be hurt, you could be rejected. But feel, being fully known is the only way in your marriage relationship for you to feel fully loved. 
You know, it's been really easy for me to say, that's your principle, Justin. And you know what? Like, I have biblical grounds for divorce, so you just go get fixed. And you just figure it out. And then once you're fixed, then we can get back to the vision that I had for our marriage relationship. But I had to recognize that I had to choose to be a person of truth. And the truth was, is that regardless of my marriage status, I struggled with bitterness. I struggled with an unforgiving heart. And that's the principle that I want to leave you, that ordinary is defeated when we choose to forgive. And I think we all want to be forgiving people. You know, the conversation that Jesus has with the apostle Peter, Peter says like, how many times do we need to forgive? And he throws out this number seven times. Well, in those days, the Jewish rabbis taught that you only had to forgive people three times and then you could be done. You guys, could you imagine if we could go to Target and buy forgiveness stickers, just like start handing them out and you're like, we would have no friends or family, but we'd understand forgiveness. And then Jesus responds to Peter. He says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Why? Because Jesus knew that forgiveness is a process. And that process begins when we get truthful about our wounds. I call it the church fight because I know all of you have had it. You know, like you wake up on Sunday morning and everyone's in a bad mood. Even the two-year-old, you're like, dude, you take naps. And so you fight, fight, fight in the house. And then what do you say? Go get in the car. So you get in the car. I'm not really sure why. And then what happens? World War III breaks out. And so then tears are shed, inappropriate sign language is being had and someone cuts you off. And then you're like, what? And then that car that cut you off turns into the church parking lot. And you're like, oh, come on. And then like, you know what? We're gonna go in the side door because no one will be there. And you go in the side door and who is there? Pastor Matt. And you're like, come on. And so he's like, hey fam, how are you doing? And you're like, we're great. And you look at your kids, you're like, tell them you're great. <laughs> Oftentimes we hold each other hostage in the process of forgiveness because we're not willing to tell the truth. So I had to get real about my heart and I needed to honor my grief and figure out what to do with it. And I realized that for most of us, we get angry, but we don't know what to do with it. Uh, but bitterness and anger are not part of the story of healing. Righteous anger is what changes. Righteous anger says something needs to stop. Something needs healed. Something needs to change. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. You see, I think for many of us, when we feel angry, we don't know what to do with it. So we end up just being bitter. Why? I think bitterness gets a bad rap because for many of us, we choose bitterness like one brick at a time because we think, man, if we can build a wall so high, then that person cannot have access to hurt me again. But the problem with bitterness is it becomes this fortress that surrounds you, that keeps you from living the life that God has called you to. And bitterness always lends itself to resentment and resentment is like a cancer. It begins to affect all all relationships. And so I realize that the same journey of being a person of truth and choosing brokenness is the same journey of forgiveness. When we get truthful about our wounds and we honor our grief, that we choose that righteous anger to choose something different, that God has given us the gift of brokenness. And brokenness is a posture of forgiveness that says whatever it takes. Like I wanna offer it. I'm not really sure how, and so as I began to forgive Justin, I was like, man, forgiveness heals relationships. And so I wanted to heal relationship with my best friend. So a year after the affair, I wrote a letter and I told her that I loved her. I told her that I forgave her. I told her that I wanted her to find freedom from bitterness and resentment. And I wanted her to walk in the brokenness and the healing and the freedom found of not carrying that. So a week goes by after sending the letter, a month goes by, a year, and then 10 years go by and I never hear a response. I was given the opportunity through a mutual friend to literally go on national television to share about the forgiveness of Jesus. It was insane. And I felt so honored. I got to share the principle of forgiveness that we talk about in the book, and talk about my relationship with my husband and this desire to one day see my friend and we're gonna, it's gonna be repair and restore, it's gonna be amazing. 
Well, about a week after that interview aired, my best friend wrote me a letter, and it was the letter that I had waited for so long for, and I tell people it was the best letter that someone could write who is not sorry, who is not truly broken. And when I say I was devastated, I was so embarrassed because I was wrong. I had written a book, I went on national TV, and I was wrong. Forgiveness does not restore relationships. And I felt like I was back on my couch saying, God, are you kidding me? Like, have you ever been there where you just thought God would show up and he didn't show up? And not only did he not show up, you felt like you got it all wrong even when you were trying to do it right. Like, have you ever been there? And I just lost my mind on God. And I was like, Jesus, you have no idea what it is like to go through this. Like, why do I keep getting put in this place and feeling like you just drop kick me in the end? Like, have you ever been there? And what I love about our Savior is that Jesus didn't make me feel shameful or guilty. He said, come to me, bring me the truth of your wounds and let me remind you that I do. Church family, we have a Jesus that knows what it's like to walk in community and his community got to experience heaven touching earth through miracles right before their eyes. And when Jesus was beaten, when he was being made fun of, when he had a crown of thorns that were pierced into his skull and he is looking around for support, no one is to be found. Not one friend. We have a Jesus that carries his cross to the ultimate death and he is so tired in so much pain that he is looking for at least just one friend and no one is to be found. And so a stranger helps him carry his cross to his ultimate death. We have a Jesus who is hanging on the cross and as if things could not get any worse, the Roman soldiers were told in the gospels that they stripped Jesus of his clothes and then they begin to barter over them. And Jesus gets audacious with his love. And he prays this prayer from the cross, my God, my God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You see, true forgiveness is when we offer it regardless of how the person responds because it's what Jesus did for us, that he chose us and offers his forgiveness regardless of how we respond. You see, forgiveness is free, trust is earned. It's a different conversation. And oftentimes, forgiveness feels like a get out of jail free card. And here's the hard truth. Forgiveness does not restore relationships, not always. I still struggle with that. But forgiveness will always restore your heart. Will you choose? Will you choose to live in the freedom of knowing you don't have to hide, will you choose to live in the freedom of knowing you are forgiven and you are loved and you are chosen and Jesus calls you his? It's an invitation to belong before you believe. Will you choose? Let's pray. Jesus, I know for many of us, this hard conversation, the vulnerability of living in truth, and just the absolute, uh, it's scary to offer forgiveness of the what if, what if we get hurt again? What if I get duped again? What if it isn't real? Jesus, I pray that you would help every single person here online be reminded that freedom is how we live when we choose to forgive. Forgiveness resurrects what bitterness tries to destroy. Jesus, there's somebody here today that they just know that they are not worthy of forgiveness. They are the adulterer. They're the one who messed up their lives. They're the person that messed up relationships. Will you remind them today that the ground is level at the foot of the cross while we were still sinners, you chose us. Help us receive your love today. It's in your name I pray, amen.